Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our final Chautauqua. We appreciate you joining us this afternoon. My name is Stephanie Boyle, and I'm a program officer with Maryland Humanities. Uh, Maryland Humanities creates and supports educational experiences in the humanities that inspire all Marylanders to embrace lifelong learning, exchange ideas openly, and enrich their communities. And I am joined here today by storyteller, civil rights advocate, and teaching artist, Arthuretta Holmes Martin. Arthuretta, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Thank you for having me. Um, for those of you who are viewing, uh, are viewing this live, you can leave your questions if you're on Zoom in the Q&A, or if you are on Facebook Live in the comment section, and we will do our best to answer as many as possible over the next 30 minutes or so. Uh, so to begin, Arthreta, I just wanted to ask you, what inspired you to portray Fannie Lou Hamer? Well, I guess it was about four or five years ago, a friend of mine, uh, MJ, is a artist from the West Coast that had moved um, to the DC area. And there was a Baptist convention and she wanted Fannie Lou Hamer to read be present at that event. I had done some other work for MJ and I said, sure. That's when I first did Fannie Lou Hamer a few years ago. And since that time, I sort of put Fannie Lou on the shelf and reenacted several other women activists, voting rights activists. And then this opportunity came and Fannie Lou's persona was more than happy to accommodate. Thank you. And so talk to us a bit about how you put this performance together. What sources did you find? Um, you know, what really played a role in, in the creation of it? And, you know, throughout this Chautauqua uh, this summer, you know, we've gone from the 1600s all the way to modern times. So certainly you have, you know, um, we can actually listen to Fannie Lou's speeches. And so tell us a bit about how you formatted it and the, and the setting that you present her in, in your performance. Well, let me first start with the sources. There are many sources for Fannie Lou Hamer as an activist. There's not a lot out there about her person personal life. So I relied a lot on a lot of materials that were written about her. One, This Little Light of Mine was written in uh, 1980s after she passed. I have like goo gobs of books about Fannie Lou. <laughs> I watched a lot of videos because getting her persona, her stature was very important because to just recite her in my voice wouldn't have done um, honor for her. Those are the things that I, I used. I used a lot of uh, secondary sources. I don't call them primary because I didn't actually speak with her or anyone directly to ask those questions. I actually, when I first found out about this, I was planning to go to Mississippi until COVID came. And once COVID came, I couldn't make that trip. So I relied on secondary sources, videos, books, uh, research materials that I found online. Now, as far as the setting, that was tough because I, the story itself evolved. It was, of course, when you do this work, there's so much story to tell. You don't know quite what parts to pick out. I decided to let it just flow. Once I let the story write itself and I wound up in one moment in time, which is after her testimony, that is when I had to figure out the setting. And the setting was a wood room where she was staying with friends after her testimony. She's, you know, doing the Green Book. We couldn't just stay in hotels. We couldn't stay in hotels in Atlantic City. So that was the setting, just this wood room, a wooden home where she and other civil rights activists were staying. So, um, 
we we get to see your performance as Fanny Lou um, just after she's given her her speech uh, to the Democratic Convention. Um, so we have a question here from Nicholas, um, and he and he asked the question. Um, it says uh, at the at the prologue after your performance, and um, that equal that uh, sorry, excuse me. <laughs> He's a, he asked that um, it's, it mentions equality of representation was obtained for the state democratic uh, delegations. What in practice did that mean? So, so let's talk a little bit about what she was fighting for at that convention and what she does as a result of their answers. Very good question. People put a lot of emphasis on that speech. And they assume, I being one of them, assumed that that speech made a difference right after she gave it. It did not. Because little, she didn't know this, but her speech was preempted on television by the President of the United States, President Lyndon Johnson, who was, I've heard, now again, I can't ask him directly, but through all of the information that I've gathered, he was, afraid of Fannie Lou Hamer because she was non-compromising. So he preempted her speech. Her speech was not televised till later. At, he was also working behind the scenes to make sure that those delegates from Mississippi were not seated. And that's exactly what happened. They were not seated. They, um, there was a compromise that they were going to get two seats and they would be at large, meaning they would not be representing their constituents in Mississippi. Um, that is what happened. However, just like so many other things with the civil rights movement, her work was not in vain. It took two years and they eventually did gain seats in the Democratic Party. There's more to that. She ran for office and a lot of other things, but um, immediately after that, it did not give the fruit that they had hoped, which was for all of them to be seated. But in time, it did. Yeah, it wasn't until 1972 that she was actually um, elected as the as a delegate as well, um, which is you know you you think like you said, there's such a, an immediate response. Well, it. it it took her, you know, a long, a very long time to see the, the fruits of her labor, mm -hmm. um, which actually is a transition into uh, another question that we have um, from Christopher. Um, and he asked, if Fannie Lou Hamer were alive today, what do you think she would say about the current protests against systemic racism and police violence taking place throughout the country and in countries outside of the United States? Walk together chilling is what she would say. Keep it up. Do not give up. She would be both proud, I think, and sad that notwithstanding the lives that were lost, the fighting that happened, here we are almost 60 years later, and we're still pretty much fighting the same battles. Um, she would be proud, but she would say, hold the line, just keep on pushing. I think is how she would see what is going on now. Now, of course there are, you know, we have elected officials. We have far more elected officials that are um, African-American than we did in the early 60s. A lot of that work caused the establishment of the Congressional Black Caucus and all of those things, but the forces that are oppressing and suppressing voters still exist and they continue to do those things. People want to have a voice in how their lives are managed and they deserve that right. That is a human right. We must make sure it is our responsibility to make sure that people continue to have that right. Thank you. 
So in addition to her work around voting rights, um, which I'm sure we will we will come back to because it's such a significant part of, of her story and who she was as a person. Um, she also worked to help agricultural communities. You know, we, we learned that, um, you know, she was a, a sharecropper and she was started uh, working at the age of six. Um, so, so we know that she also helps to to create impacts with the agricultural communities. Um, can you talk about her efforts related to that and her and how the legacy of black owned farms and agricultural co-ops continue today? Mm, that is a course, it, but I will keep it simple because it is both complicated and simple. When Fannie Lou grew up, she was always hungry. Their clothes were always tattered, but yet they work the fields. Uh, the, as I stated in the monologue, um, hunger was a big part. And she connected as a child the color of her skin to her hunger and wanted to be white because she thought if she was white, she would then be able to eat. And her mother instilled in her to be proud of being a woman, to be proud of being black. That was the catalyst that caused her to not only advocate for voting rights, but also human rights. Human rights include the right to have food. When she came back from her event in Atlantic City, she started a co-op by buying seed, by finding land, and encouraging the people to develop their own crops. She talks about planting okra and tomato and beans and squash and all of these things and have piglets. She had a pig farm where families could take a pig as long as they brought a pig back because they didn't have money so it was a bartering system. And this bartering system, Freedom Farm was the name of her co-op, was what they used to maintain and feed the people. Now, how does that connect with farming today, African Americans at that time owned tremendous amount of land in the South, and they could do farming, not just those that worked on plantations and were sharecroppers, some owned their own land. But as our economy has evolved, the powers that suppressed voting also found that this bartering system cut them out of that economy. So they developed methods and methodology to take that land in so many different ways. Um, the Black Farmer, I, I did a lot of uh, civil rights work with the Department of Education and the Black Farmers Movement, which is still going on, by the way, because a lot of Black farmers' land has been co-opted. Um, and she would be very saddened by that because a lot of that happened after her death. But the co-op is extremely important. We have cities, we even have rural communities that are food deserts. How does that happen? Because the systems and infrastructures have put up barriers to prevent black farmers from farming, from competing, and from serving. Thank you. Um... We have a lot of great questions here. Let's see which one. <laughs> it's hard to know what to transition to next. You guys are really doing a fantastic job. I so appreciate it. Um, we have someone who, we've had a couple questions about her family. Um, and so we have uh, Joanne here asking uh, what became of her daughters um, and also a, a follow-up unrelated question, but uh, what office did she run for and was she elected? So we can start off maybe just with her her family. What happened to her her daughters? We also had a question about what happened to her husband. Wow. Um, I, I, I love the way fan, I, I want to talk about Pat just for a minute. Let me start with that because you know you just asked me four questions, right? <laughs> I'm so, sorry about that. <laughs> no, that's okay. That's okay. Um, I, I want to talk about Pat because his role in this is pivotal. He was her, the wind under her wings. 
He was a quiet, supportive, strong advocate in everything she wanted to do, even though their lives were threatened. What happened to her husband? He eventually passed, but during that time, he was by her side. Until her death, he was by her side. And the thing that he did that I find so honorable was even though they didn't necessarily live on their land, they made sure that her remains were buried on her land. Those are the things that Pat did for her, Perry Hammond. He was, I would like to know more about him. When I go to Mississippi, I plan to do more research on him. Um, his background, I don't know a lot about him, but I do know this much. He stood by her side. Now, her daughters, both were adopted as I stated in the, um, in the monologue, both be are advocates for civil rights. Both lived, they lived to adulthood. If you Google Fannie Lou, you will see various interviews. One of her daughters was very shy and didn't like to be on camera. The other daughter is um, still advocating to support the work of her mother. As a matter of fact, I went to a live event maybe three, four years ago in Washington, D.C., where one of her daughters was there talking about the love her mother gave her and support of her. So uh, her, her immediate family and I were extremely supportive of Fannie Lou, and they are still continuing and supporting her legacy. Thank you. Um, now, I, did I miss a question in there? Because uh, I know it. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, the, the, another part of that question was asking about uh, what, what, what she ran for and if she was elected. So let's talk a little bit about her, her life uh, in politics in that way. All right. Let me see here. I knew that question was coming. She ran for a to be a state delegate um, after the voter registration. She, oh, she did so much. Let me see here. I want to get the exact year. She was seated as a delegate in 1968, August 20th. Um, she also, I want to say she ran for the Senate and she didn't think, and I want to give you the exact year, but I may not be able to find it. Um, anybody, y'all know how to Google. I, I don't know the exact year, but I know she ran for Senate, not because she thought she was going to win, but because she wanted to bring attention to the structural um, and institutional racism that existed in Mississippi, um, in Sunflower County, in Ruleville. But um, yes, she, that was the extent of her running for political office. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so you talk about this a, a, a bit, um, I think at the end of your, per, at, the, yeah, at the end of your performance, um, you talk about the brutality that Fannie Lou faced. She had permanent damage to her eye and to her kidneys as a result of the brutality. She was imprisoned. Um, uh, and we have someone asking the question about, um, you know, when someone came to get her out of prison, you know, they were also arrested. Um, so talk to us a bit about, you know, why she faced this pr pr police brutality um, and sort of that trauma. I mean, she's targeted by the KKK for a period of, of her life um, and has to constantly move around, um, which also leaves deep psychological damage to her. Um, so talk to the audience a bit about, you know, that experience and what that was like for for her and what she faced along the way. Cause, yeah. Wow. The physical abuse was not only for her. We have to understand how these systems work. And she was more than just beat. Um, and a lot of the, I didn't bring this out in the, um, monologue, but I will say this here. She was sexually assaulted, not raped, but stripped naked and her behind, her buttocks 
were beaten with a jackhammer. We have to understand what that does, not just to the individual, but the intent of that is to strike fear in the community to not step out of line. That is why systems oppress the leaders. This is an interesting time, and I'm, I'm going to go back to your the second half of your question in a minute as far as police brutality. But this is the thing that correlates with what is going on today. Systems that are oppressive target leaders. They target leaders because they believe if they cut out the leader, the movement will die. The genius, if you want to call it that, of the current movement is they have positioned themselves, whether they did it consciously or subconsciously, for there to not be a true leader. The movement is a total culture. During Fannie Lou Hamer's time um, with the police brutality and the threats, because the threats and police brutality never stop. Let's just make that very clear. They shut down that farm. Uh, they found ways to put um, any money she bought to come in and foreclose on it. It was very difficult. She died poor. She died very poor, notwithstanding the fact she had a land, had land and all those other things. But the, the abuse by the police and the police were very much involved, not just at the local level. And a lot of folk would like to think that it was just the Ruleville police or the Mississippi State Troopers. No, the FBI, even though they did an investigation of the abuse she experienced, um, sort of excused away the behavior of the police in Ruleville and in Mississippi, not unlike the things that they're doing today. I will say police are held far more accountable today than ever, 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 ever. We have come a long way, even though we want more and we want more accountability, we have to understand where we came from. So I, I think that uh, the abuse had a significant amount of effect on her, but not necessarily in the way that the oppressors wanted it to be. She became stronger and she became more pivotal. I'm going to answer the second part of your question real quick, but I do want to say this much. There's a lot of classism that goes on in every community. The Black community is not an exception. We have to understand that Fannie Lou Hamer had a, she dropped out of school in the sixth grade. She never went back. But yet, she was a phenomenal orator. Um, she wound up traveling to Africa. I watched her on Tony Brown's journal articulate this, she could get in with those PhD folk, <laughs> articulate her position. She was proud. So um, yes, it affected her, but not in the way that the oppressors and other people would think. The lot of that, she was brilliant. She was by absolutely a genius very strategic in the things that she did. Now you can ask me the second part of that three-part question that I forgot. I'll get, I'll, I'd like to say I'll get better at it, but I, I probably won't. <laughs> um, I, I actually think, I think you, you answered, you know, that, that really wonderfully. And I want to uh, move on to a different question uh, that was asked, excuse me. Okay. Um, we had someone asking the question uh, around you right in the end part that on her, her grave, she has the quote, I'm sick of tired of being sick and tired. Do you know when she, when she said that quote or any, any of maybe her family's thoughts as to um, why they use that? I, in my research, cannot put a finger on, okay, this is the day that we're acknowledging that she's sick and tired of being sick and tired because she said it all the time doing her activist work. I will say this. Now, this is something I wanted to say earlier, and this is what left me. She used song. I don't want, we can talk about being sick and tired of being sick and tired. 
and it is a phenomenal piece, but she used song to strengthen her. This little light of mine first became her mantra after or during the beatings, before the beatings in, in um, Wanola, Mississippi, and during the beatings and after she got out. So the song, she was a preacher, singer, un, um, professional, but very professional articulator of what she knew was God's word. She believed that there was a purpose. She was fulfilling God's purpose. So therefore that gave her the strength to take the beatings, the ostracism, all of what she experienced. This little light of mine um, was pivotal. Sick and tired of being sick and tired. I think she said that so much I couldn't find. And because it, 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 it wasn't, it's just Fannie Lou. I mean, as soon as you say, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired, you just think Fannie Lou. Not necessarily I could find a point where the first time she said it. So to ask you, Arthuretta, were you always planning to put in the music and singing whenever you did her performance, when you did your performance as Fannie Lou? The first time, because she did not sing at the Democratic Convention in um, Atlantic City, I did not include singing. This time, because I had done so much research and I found how important music was, I did sing. I, I sang because this is going to sound weird. But if you're going to do Fannie Lou Hamer, you got to be able to sing because she had an awesome sauce voice. That was, the, that was her. Those spirituals were her. So you had to sing. So, yes, she said, if you're going to tell my story, you won't have to sing. So there you go. Thank you. And ask uh, you another question. Oh, Susan asked the question of how did you start as a storyteller and actor? I think I started as a vocalist. I've been doing this kind of work all my life. My whole family has this gift. We, I am from, my father's from Charleston. My mother's from North Carolina, um, Charleston, South Carolina, not West Virginia. And my mother's, uh, both of them are, are Gullah. And um, that's just part of our culture, just as it was part of uh, Fannie Lou's culture to tell stories and sing songs. That's what we do. I honestly did not know this was an art form until I was finished working. <laughs> I didn't know you could actually get paid for what we did, walking, sitting around the table <laughs> after dinner. Um, I, be, I have learned to perfect the gift. I was an actress in high school. I didn't pursue it. I pursued other things. Now uh, I will be doing this for the rest of my life, both perfecting my voice do not think any young people on the call that your voice goes to pot. It only goes to pot if you do not perfect it. You must continue to study. And, and then when it comes to perfecting your stagecraft, the same thing is true. You must continue to perfect the craft, even as a storyteller. Thank you. Um, we've got a lot of great questions here, so I'm gonna try to sort of rapid fire them off. Um, and I'll make my answer shorter. <laughs> Nancy asks, uh, she says, it struck me that Emmett Till's lynching awakened Fannie Lou Hamer's activism. Um, it was the same for Ida B. Wells, um, who began writing um, after the lynching of three friends. Um, it's both, the heartbreak is overwhelming. Did Fannie Lou Hamer write or speak of Emmett Till, or is that something you inferred from um, what you know about her life? I did not infer it. She actually said it, and it was in, it's documented in this little light of mine, where she, that did some, that was absolute, those were her words almost verbatim. There are pieces in there that were my inference, that was not one of them. Um, because she made it a point to talk about in this little light of mine, the fact that they had just adopted a daughter and it was only one year later that this 
horrible thing happened. And the other thing that I found interesting in this little light of mine was that um, the, 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 the biographer who wrote the story, it was as if that, she was 44 when she took on this activist work. That was a pivotal time in her life, it was that murder. She knew other people that were lynched personally, but it was that murder because of the proximity of the age of her daughter that caused her to then decide, I'm, I got to take a stand. We have a question from Megan and she asked, was Fannie Lou Hamer close to any other women involved in the civil rights movement? Um, and we can transition that as well as some other civil rights leaders that we've sort of discussed as we were prepping on Freda. Oh my goodness. Okay. There were a lot of women. Let me just say this. In my research, and I don't want to give a whole, um, dissertation or description of women's activism. But little is it said, and as little as it's told, women, two thirds of the activists in the South were women. They were like Fannie Lou Hamer. As a matter of fact, it was a woman who told um, Fannie Lou about being able to vote. She didn't even know she could vote until she was 44 years old. There were several, there were many, many, many women who participated in the civil rights movement. Do they get their just credit? No, they do not. But I want to get, I don't want to, um, let me say this. On January 4th, 1965, on behalf of Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, and this was the day, the women that attended were Miss Hamer, Annie Devine, Victoria Gray. They were the three women that went to challenge the status quo. There are other women that I, I know someone personally whose mother worked with um, Fannie Lou, who was in Mississippi, who's still alive, by the way. Um, trying to, to see if what other names. I'm sure, Google it. Those are the ones that come off the top of my head. But um, yeah, Google it. There were a lot of women that were activists in the movement. There were more women. I would argue there were more women than there were men. Just the men, because of our culture, got more credit. Thank you. So let's talk a bit about, um, you know, we, we know that she's a SNCC organizer. And, um, you know, I think we'd be remiss as we talk about the Civil Rights and Voting Rights Act if we didn't talk about Representative John Lewis, who just passed recently, and his relationship with Fannie Lou Hamer. So can you talk to us a bit about how they were connected? Oh, they were connected. It's, as much as folk, um, this is not on the forefront. And actually, this is the, gonna be my next piece is gonna be to talk, because I'm gonna have to dig for it, is to talk about the relationship between um, John Lewis and Fannie Lou Hamer. John Lewis was the co-founder of the Student Nonviolent um, Core, what is it, Correlating Committee, SNCC. And he heard about Fannie Lou he was very much aware of Fannie Lou. As a matter of fact, there were several people, Malcolm X, Dr. Martin Luther King, um, other leaders who knew about the work that Fannie Lou Hamer was doing in Mississippi. What they did, and this is one little piece of history that you have to dig to find. The only actual connection, because I Googled, I tried to find pictures of the two of them together and just couldn't. But what I did find was a manifesto where she was invited with two other women to go to Africa with John Lewis. Now, John Lewis wouldn't have just picked anybody to go to Africa that Harry Belafonte funded if he didn't know her very well. And the purpose for that trip was to learn how to strengthen the movement because at the same time the civil rights movement was going on, there was the anti-colonization that was going on on the continent of Africa. So they were trying to collaborate efforts. Fannie Lou Hamer was part of that. And that's when she met Malcolm X. And I do wanna say this, 
about Fannie Lou Hamer and John Lewis. The John Lewis of SNCC was a fireball. He was something else. And he, he had already arranged for Malcolm X, after the trip to Africa, he had arranged for Malcolm X to go and speak in Mississippi to support Fannie Lou Hamer. Those were the relationships that happened. It's unfortunate Malcolm X was killed in less than two weeks after he left the trip to Africa. So he never got the opportunity to speak in Mississippi. Thank you. And, you know, um, we're talking about these great activists. What do you think activists today can learn um, from Hamer? You have to be spiritually grounded. And when I say spiritually grounded, you must believe this is not a game. You must understand that anything can be a trip for a pushback. But understand that if you are spiritually grounded and you keep pressing, opportunities, situations, people will come in your life to keep you focused so that you can accomplish and contribute towards the greater goal. That's what they can learn from Fannie Lou Hamer. The mere fact that we're talking about her right now tells you that she is continuing to live in spirit. Not that you necessarily want to go through the things that she went through or the thing that George Floyd went through or the thing that Breonna Taylor, whose names we would never know had they not been subjected to police brutality. But what we do know is that Fannie Lou Hamer believed with all her being in the work that she was doing. And that's what we can learn from Fannie Lou Hamer. Now, I do want to make one correction to something I said. Both of, I want to mention um, Fannie Lou Hamer's daughters. One passed in 1967 prior to Fannie Lou. She died from complications of anemia, malnutrition, and poor health care. We have to understand that notwithstanding her notoriety, she died from diabetes and heart disease. When we talk about Black life and we talk about the experiences of African Americans, there is so much generational trauma that's there. So when we talk about what can we learn from her, when you see an African-American of today, no matter what they have achieved, they are still the descendant of generational trauma. So some of us respond to it differently. Fannie Lou responded to her circumstances differently. When we want to judge, we should not, we should judge with through the lenses of the generational trauma that we carry and we all can I respond and do the best we can with what we have? Thank you. I'll ask one final question to you that I think uh, segues nicely into that, which is what do you hope people remember as a result of, of your performance today? If there was that one takeaway. Read, read. Do not take the things that you hear and say about a person or a situation for face value. That's not to necessarily criticize them or to pick apart because I am sure there are little tidbits of facts that are twisted because as I read a lot of different interpretations of her life, I saw a lot of different things that may conflict. But you have to look at the spirit of the work that she did and the totality. But you also have to know what actually happened. So I really recommend after you hear my performance, the Q&A, you go and do the research. And if something wasn't just quite right, say, that's cool. She'll get it, change it next time. Or I'm going to do more work and I'm going to write about this too. Because that is how you give honor to other people. 
That's how you give honor to ancestors who went on before. Can I say one last thing about Fannie Lou? And I know we gotta wrap up. Fannie Lou Hamer was not just about black rights, but poor whites because she was just as sensitive to the treatment of people who were not black. That was a lot of her appeal such so many others. This was, as um, Reverend Barber of North Carolina says, this is a poor people's movement. He has picked up the mantra of the Black Panther Party, of Fannie Lou Hamer, of Reverend Dr. King. He has picked up that mantra as the leader. So if you wanna see a modern day example of the work that Fannie Lou Hamer did, look at Reverend Barber from North Carolina, um, who is, advocating for all people because we many of the people that are being oppressed in this country are being oppressed in so many of the same ways there's not enough food they don't have jobs um we're dealing with police brutality look at what's happening in portland what look at the things that happen right here in dc my son actually was down there when a lot of these things happen that is what i'd like to leave with L- study learn your history and use that as your catalyst. Arthur, thank you so much. There are a multitude of people thanking you for your performance and in the questions and in the chat. So um, I thank you as well for for highlighting this fantastic woman and also bringing all of yourself today to this um, and to help educate us and encourage um, everyone who enjoyed us who joined us today. So I thank you again um, for all that you have done. Um, For those of you uh, who have not watched the performance yet, it is up on our website at um, mdchautauqua.org or on our Facebook page at Maryland Humanities. Um, And I thank everyone who joined us over this course of four weeks. It was a, a pleasure to bring these four amazing women to your attention and I hope you enjoyed it as well. Have a great rest of your afternoon and thank you.